Well, in the in the time that I've got left, I uh, am going to speak to Saul's number seven, which is how to dumb it down. And really, this is important because uh, I think it's important for us to be able to communicate directly with the jury. And so, I always have a backup plan in case uh, Plan A doesn't go. And uh, this is, uh, and my, of course, my battery is just now. Well, there it went. You want to switch? Uh, <laughs> you want to switch? It won't do me any good, I don't think. You can't plug that in, into there. No. I bet. Okay. It's not unless you got a. I, you said you always had a backup. Plan. I do. Have so a I, I was looking for the backup is. battery. You know. Um, I don't know. I had a, I had a, uh, I brought my expert witness on my laptop, and I've had it on since one o'clock, and uh, I guess the battery didn't last so long. I mean, I've got a thumb drive. That's what I'm saying. If you want to move it from one computer to another, the battery's dead. I can't witness recanted it, so. <laughs> um, Jerry's not going to buy this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Especially. Hey, he works for them foreign places. Uh, what's that there, Hitachi? Well, uh, what I had was a, I had a, uh, a presentation of an expert that explains what financial fraud is in terms that the jury can understand. And um, unfortunately, uh, Rochelle had to use my power cord, so it's, it's uh, not here. So... What we're going to do is we're going to show you a demonstration of how to present your financial expert. And Saul, do you do you have your uh, not Saul, um, Chris? Chris, do you have your do you still have yours on the machine? I, if you don't, I just need to I just need to switch it to here. Yeah, I just sent it to whoever's running the program. I think they brought it up on the, the monitor, so I assume it's on the machine. Yeah, that still is. Yeah, you can exit out of all that. You can even delete it. It's not a number. Well, which one were we using? Were we using your stick? No, we were using somebody else's laptop. Oh, you were? But I've got, you want that chart, right? Yep. I've got it. Actually, I've got it if I can just get this to come on, but I don't know why it's not coming on. Oh, we got it now. Yeah. Um, part of what you've got to be able to do when you're presenting your expert, and I've done a lot of asset forfeiture. I was interested in Jack's talk because uh, I think for a long time in Texas, I might have been the only lawyer to actually forfeit uh, and foreclose on uh, some producing oil wells. And part of, the, part of the ability to communicate these fraud cases to your, uh, to your jury, it doesn't really matter how smart your expert is, and it really doesn't matter how much knowledge he has. If he can't communicate that effectively to your jury your, or your judge, you know, in Saul's cases, if he's not able to get past the dismissal of the motion for summary judgment, the case is over. If he is able to get past the dismissal and the motion for summary judgment, then he, then he told me that his case is, uh, well, I mean, Chris told me that his case is generally settled. And so that's really important because um, communicating this effectively with the jury, I think, is sort of paramount. And I thought that Chris's pre presentation this morning gave us an excellent opportunity to do that. First of all, you want to present your experts uh, CV and uh, his credentials so that the judge accepts him as an expert and you get past your Dalbert challenge. And I've got a CV and Bobby came as my backup plan and I appreciate you for being here, Bobby. Bobby Thrasher is a student of mine and he was going to play uh, the role of my expert had not my <coughs> Dell computer crashed. Um, but part of, the, part of the plan is not only presenting your expert but present him in a persuasive and very communicative, communicative style. And so if I could have you take the witness stand over there, Chris, just pull up a chair right there in the front. Yeah. 
I wish I could have played the little video for you because it really makes a it really makes this point. But rather than you know, you're going to go through your expert, and I'm going to ask you the direct questions. And if we didn't have the screen down, I'd have you up here in the courtroom. But um, rather than just go through it mundanely in this fashion, um, I think it's effective for us to focus our jury and the judge's attention. And you've got a chart here on, on your Verifone uh, example that I wanted to use. And I want you to, uh, to feel free to do this whenever you're in court, whenever you're in trial, because it's important that the jury and the judge be directed towards the exhibit and the evidence that you're trying to present. So I'd ask the court to allow you to step down. And then in your direct exam, we've already got your expert, and we don't have time to do that, but we've already got your CV and your resume and all your credentials, and you're accepted as an expert. Now I want to address your attention to this exhibit, and exhibit one, we'll call it, and we've already proven it up, and let's just go pick it up from there. Tell the jury what, the members of the jury, what this is, and what does it represent? Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what this chart represents is proof that the misreporting of Verifone's financial results for the first three quarters of 2007 caused over a billion dollars of losses to individuals and institutions that purchased that stock during the class period. And in particular, what it shows is on this date, December 3rd, 2007, just point the date out for us. Right here. Yeah. And on that date, Verifone issued a press release that said that their previously reported financial results for the first three quarters of 2007 were false and were overstated. They had overstated their earnings, they had overstated gross margins, and as a result of that news, and this was the initial revelation of that bad news, that unexpected negative bad news, the company's stock price declined almost 46%, as you can see in the third column. Now let me just slow you down. You've, you've, you've said a mouthful and uh, might be going over somebody's head like me. What do you mean when you say they've overstated it? What, what the company did in the first three quarters of 2007 was say, we earned, for example, $5 million this quarter, $6 million the next quarter, and $7 million the next quarter. Then on December 3rd, they said, oops, that's wrong. We really only earned $2 million in the first quarter, we lost four million in the second quarter, and we lost ten million in the third quarter. So now, why is that significant? That's significant because all other things being equal, the higher income you report, the higher the stock price is going to be. Obviously, you know, the more money a company makes, the more valuable it is, and that's reflected in the price of the stock. Mm -hmm. So when they came out on December third and said, "Oops, we really didn't make that much money." In fact, we made less in one quarter and we actually lost money in the other two quarters. Investors react to that by saying, oh, well, if you made less, obviously the company is worth less, plus which we don't know now what's going to happen going forward. We're probably going to make less going forward, too. And everybody exited the stock because they thought that it was not worth you know, the $45 that it was trading at on December 2nd, 2007. Now, now when you say they exited the stock, they sold the stock. They sold the stock. And what does that, what happens, why is that important? That's important because as more and more people sell, it's simply a supply and demand. More people want to sell, less people want to buy, the price goes down. Okay, now show us what's important between this column and, and these two columns here. Why, why, are, why are these important to compare? These are important to compare because you need to prove that the damages are related and caused by the overstatement of earnings before. And the way you do that is by comparing the percentage change in the company's stock price to one, what happened in the market overall, the S&P 500, and what happened to the peer group of companies, companies that are in the business similar than Verifone. For example, if the S&P 500 and the peer group also went down 46% that day, you couldn't say that the bad news that Verifone released on December 3rd caused the price decline. Obviously, something caused something else, maybe planes flying into a building or otherwise, you know, caused the entire market to go down. You need to show that the overstatement of earnings before and the revelation of that overstatement on December 3rd is what caused this stock price decline. And the way you do that 
among other ways, is to compare it to the index that the company stock trades on and to their peer group. And when we see such a huge disparity what is between that? this, a huge difference, when we see Verifone stock price going down 46%, and yet the S&P 500 went down less than 1% and the peer group remained unchanged, it's clear in that regard that the bad news released by the company, the company-specific news, not industry-related news, caused the stock price decline, and therefore you establish the element of causation, which is a necessary element in a 10b-5 fraud case. Okay. Now, I would, if we had more time, we've only got five <coughs> minutes, but I would have uh, him use this dry erase board and make some of these calculations where they're meaningful for the jury so that they can follow us along. You can sit down. Um, part of uh, part of the fact that you part of the reason that you want to get your witness up to, to come to this complicated exhibit is because people don't know what that means. The jury don't they don't understand the significance of these numbers. They don't understand the significance of what the percent change means and why it's so significant. Because you were telling me, Chris, at lunch that even a 16 percent change is tremendous, and 46 percent is out of this world. And so it's important for your expert to educate the jury and to show them how to do that. What I want to talk about in, in the last five minutes that I've got and what my paper was about is why are we not seeing prosecutions for these cases? I mean, we're, I've been a criminal, I'm a board certified criminal specialist. I've represented a lot of people who have had their assets try to be frozen and try to have their assets forfeited. In fact, I had a case that you know, uh, went to the Supreme Court on the issues of the Kurth Ranch and Nursery. And what is, it, we should be asking ourselves is, if you look at everything that Jack just talked to us about, all of those are ill-gotten gains. They have no trouble f filing forfeiture against my client who structured a financial transaction to avoid reporting requirements. You shake your head, you've seen that. But why are they not, Bernie Madoff, okay, we got one. They went after Bernie Madoff. Big deal. Who did they go after? Whose assets did they go after in Enron? Whose assets did they go after uh, in AIG? Why are they not taking these corporate schmucks who got these million dollar bonuses and forfeiting their money? Why are they not? Because those still meet, those are the ill gotten gains. They don't have a problem going after the drug dealer, they don't have a problem going after. Uh, anybody that's committing blue collar crime, so why are they not going after these? Why are they not going after these? Uh, he was telling me, cut it Why are they not going after these other type crimes? Well, it's interesting. Um, RTC is where I kind of cut my teeth. I was doing some RTC defense um, when they, you know, as Saul told you, it was big litigation in Texas there for a while. and. Uh, not only did they have the most FBI agents in the country working on it, uh, it was big work for defense lawyers there for, for a while. And what I learned was, is that, and I'm not singling out any, any group or any entity, but what, what I learned was is they're not particularly good at it. And so if you have a good expert, and your expert can follow the money, and can trace the money, and can prove the money, for some reason, Jurors and judges are willing to give the benefit of the doubt because if you are making a profit, that's okay. And they want to give the benefit of the doubt to the guy who's making a profit, even if you show that he lied on his financial statement. I mean, what Jack was just showing you, if you go down to the bank and you got a $200,000 house and you got a car and you fill out a fraudulent financial statement, that's a felony and they'll prosecute your ass. However, if you are filing fraudulent bundles of loans, if you, are, if you have fraudulently uh, increased the value of the collateral that is uh, collateralizing these loans by billions of dollars, and I had some examples of those, they don't prosecute you whatsoever. So why is that? Why is it that our government is going after the little fish and not the big fish? And I used to have a client by the name of Alan Chichong Lao. And he was, uh, in, I'm honoring the man, he was acquitted of the charges. And he would say to me, Mr. Foreman, something wrong here. <laughs> and what you need to be asking yourself is what's going on? What is wrong here? 
something is terribly wrong that we have these sort of crimes being committed and, and Saul has, has said it and uh, every speaker you've heard today has said it. It's happening right in front of our faces. It is blatant and yet why are we not seeing asset forfeitures? Okay, what can you do about it? That was what my talk was going to be about. Because on an individual level, there are things you can do about it. In my home county in Texas, sadly, every month, they're foreclosing on 300 houses a month. 300 in my county, not in Texas. I was talking to Bill today at lunch, and he says that there's 100,000 a year annually, or you, you said in the, of, of the robo-signing frauds. Why are, why are we not prosecuting those? Why are we not <coughs> civilly prosecuting those? How do you do it? Okay, we got deceptive trade practices. Almost every state has a Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Don't forget about that. We got common law fraud. Don't forget about that. Nobody wants to do a civil RICO case because we don't understand it. It's too complicated, and it's, <laughs> but it's there. I'm just saying, you know, there are some provisions that are out there that you can utilize if you're willing to do the work. Now. Where do we get the experts? Where do we get the information to file these suits? Right down the hall. Right down the hall are some of the greatest experts in this area, and they'll be available to you. I would, I would actually, you know, make use of who you have. Chris is Chris fighting a good fight, but let me tell you, the fraud buffet is huge. Chris is fighting one area of the fraud buffet. And he's fighting it hard, and he's filing some big suits. But there is a fraud buffet that goes on and on and on and on. And it's a lot of the derivatives that are happening out of these suits that we're not thinking about. And um, I'll, uh, they're telling me to cut it off, so uh, I'll cut it. But I'll, I'll just say, I'll have my slide uh, show available because I'd like for you to see the expert opinion explaining the uh, the fraud crisis that we have going on, it, because it's explained to an elementary, it, it, it's explained to fifth graders, and it's it's the kind of program that I think we would have to explain to a jury if we were going to try a case like this. How, how can we see your program? I'll have it. Uh, you know, have you, if you got a cell phone, you can take a picture of this little uh, looks like a barcode. And it'll, you can get my whole slideshow, or if you'll email me, I'll email it to you. We'll be posting it on. Yeah, we'll the post. Yeah. It's and it's not mine. I I borrowed it from someone that created oh, it maybe on we'll be YouTube. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> We're I not just like, it, all I was property. gonna do is give you an example of how we how we need to be explaining this to juries because it's it's too complicated for them to understand. In fact, that's part of the reason that we don't see these prosecutions and that we're not doing them is, is they take a lot of work and they're very complicated to put together and to understand. So thank you all. Thank you all.